Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Kingdom come. Pray 
Jesus. Amen. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share signs of peace with one another at this time. about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. 
But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came down to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elisha said to him, stay here for the lord has sent me to the jordan but he said as the lord lives and as you yourself live i will not leave you so the two of them went on 50 uh, 50 men of the company of prophets also went and stood uh, at some distance from them and they both were standing by the jordan then elijah took his mantle rolled it up and struck the water water was parted to the one side of, to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground when they had crossed elijah said to elisha tell me what i may do for you before i am taken from you elisha said please let me inherit a double share of your spirit he responded you have asked the hard thing yet if you see me as i am being taken from you it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and the other, and Elijah went over. Words of grace, words of peace. And the title is, Who Will Take Up Your Man? Who Will Take Up Your Man? What is it that makes a prophet a prophet? You may think, well, it's the ability to perform miracles. Certainly a lot of prophets did perform miracles, but not, not all of them. Not all of them perform miracles. You may think that it's the ability to see the future. And in a sense, you're right about that. They did see the future, but not in the same way that a fortune teller would. A, a, a prophet is not going to tell you what you're going to have for dinner a week from Wednesday. That's not the way that they operate, even though they were able to see the future. Um, but mostly prophets were people who spoke for God. They spoke on God's behalf. And in order to do that, if you're going to speak for God, you got to be able to hear God to begin with. And in order to hear God, you got to be able to walk with God, to walk in the ways of God, in the paths of righteousness, to do the things that God wants us to do. John Wesley would have said that that really kind of means um, going for the means of grace, living by the means of grace, which the means of grace are circumstances that make God's voice clearer to you, that make God's presence all the better known to you, that make God's voice audible to you. That's the means of grace. And that's how a prophet would really need to live to be able to do what he was called to do. Um, and a prophet, once you hear the voice of God, and you're following along in God's footsteps and you hear the voice of God, you really don't have any other choice but to speak God's words to whoever is willing to listen, regardless of whether they like to hear what God has to say or not. 
Um, you spoke God's words not only because God wanted you to speak it, you spoke God's words because you cared. You care. You know that God cared, and you care. Prophets, prophecies were not always just nightmarish visions of what God is going to do to the bad and, and how he's going to destroy everything bad and everything like this, but rather they were warnings. Prophecies were warnings about things that would happen if you didn't change your ways, if you didn't get on the right track. And God always shows people the way out of that messy situation, whatever they were doing. He would say, this is the way you get out. And God always made the promise that whatever bad things happen, and regardless of whether people made the right choice or not, that God was going to come through in the end. God was going to come through and rule in the end. Things would be good in the end. The lamb, the lamb and the lion would lay down together. Peace would one day rule. That's God's final answer, his final solution. He would fix it in every way. He would fix the world. So if you accept this, this, this bare bones definition of what a, a prophet is, of someone who walks in the ways of God and can thus hear the voice of God and, and everything, then you realize that there's a bit of a prophet in all of us. I believe that. There's a bit of a prophet in all of us. Most of you have grown up in church, have been going to church. You've heard an awful lot of sermons. You've heard an awful lot of scripture readings. You've done an awful lot of praying, and you keep coming back for more. I'm not sure why, but you keep coming back for more. To me, that is evidence that you are seeking to know God. And depending upon where you are in that endeavor, you may be qualified to speak with prophetic authority. And perhaps the biggest test you face in knowing God and hearing God and is, is actually having the courage to speak and act on God's behalf. Not to be afflicted with the, uh, the Jonah syndrome, right? We all know the story of Jonah. God gave him a message and Jonah went and hid. And, and got on a ship and hid himself and didn't really want to go out and give that message. Yet, eventually he does. He, he, Jonah also, one of his faults was that he, he seemed to be able to love God, but he didn't really have a whole lot of love for the people he was told to preach to, the Ninevites, who he told to repent. He didn't have that love. He had a lot to learn. And, um, and eventually God did get his way. Uh, but a good prophet needs to regard the people that the prophet is speaking to with as much love as God regards them with. And a good prophet does not fear the reaction of the audience because he or she knows that what he or she says is spoken not only from God, but is spoken from love, from the vantage point of God's love. It comes from God comes from love. And I wanted to establish that connection between you and prophets before I went any further with this sermon, because there are many people who look at religion as a, as a passive thing, something that you experience internally and it's kept internal. You know, church is where I go to make myself feel better about myself. Church is where I go to feel accepted by others. Church is where I go to hear a sermon that may be intellectually stimulating or to hear music that is beautiful, but not ethereal. Church is where I go to meet girls. That's, that's when I worked for the youth group. That's, that was the common reason why a lot of the teenagers were going to church. There were a lot of girls there. And there's nothing wrong with going to church for any of these reasons that I just listed. We are social and, and we, we have social and psychological needs and the church can certainly fill those needs. But God calls us to act not only for ourselves, not only to gain something for ourselves, but to grow and thus to be blessing to those around us 
and to be a blessing to those who will come after us, after that sweet chariot comes and carries all of us home, God wants us to pass the mantle. God calls us to personal transformation, to become new creations in Jesus Christ so that we can lead others into that kind of transformation. We do that by speaking and acting in ways that communicate God's love to those around us, and that love may play itself out in such simple ways as being patient with the cashier at the grocery store who's having a bad day, or, or just offering a polite smile, or saying hello to the stranger. It may play itself out at a protest rally where God equips you with a megaphone, but the clearest way it plays itself out is with those who are closest to you, those who you see around you on a regular basis, those who you know, those who you love, those are the people where God's love plays itself out in you. Whereas we'll see in today's story, people who admire you, perhaps. Those are maybe the main people who benefit from the love of God as shown through your, your children, your grandchildren, your students. Elisha, Elisha, the SH. Elisha was like a disciple to Elijah, who, um, who was considered by his peers, Elijah was considered by his peers to be like the head prophet, the lead prophet. Why? Because Elijah was the one who spoke and acted out of this determined mindset that God is going to be worshipped. God, the true God, is going to be honored and worshipped in this nation. And despite the deteriorating religious situation around him, brought on by King Ahab and his, and his Phoenician bride, Queen Jezebel, bringing in these other gods, the Phoenician, the Canaanite gods and goddesses, Elijah recognized this as a real, real danger for, his, for this nation, for his nation, for his people. And you might wonder why that would be a problem. You know, why would there be a problem to have a choice of what church to go to, what gods to worship and all this? What was wrong with these Canaanite gods? Were they bad in and of their own right? But well, we don't have to answer that necessarily because we get to see that Queen Jezebel herself had problems and had uh, some moral deficiencies. She arranged for the murder of a landowner, a guy who owned a nice vineyard that her husband wanted to take, and she sets him up to be killed so that Ahab could go ahead and take the vineyard. This kind of like makes it kind of obvious. We have a problem here. And um, it, it, arranging this murder so that she could make, that her husband could make this land grab, and that's a good enough reason to get rid of all of those gods that she wanted to bring in to this nation. And I just want you to think about that logic for a second, that her behavior, Jezebel's behavior, was enough to launch that campaign against the gods that she represented. You know, we don't know, again, if those foreign gods were all good or bad, if they represented something positive, something negative, but we know that the person who promoted those gods was organizing a murder. And that should strike a chord in every Christian. There are more and more people in our neighborhoods who don't, don't know what a church is, who don't even think about a church, who don't know much about Christianity at all, but they may have the opportunity to know Jesus through you, through you. Your witness is of ultimate importance. How you present yourself is, is of immense magnitude. Jezebel was a murderer. She had planned a murder. What does that say about the gods that she worshipped? What does your behavior say about the god that you worship? 
And who is closest to you? Who are the people who are closest to you? Who are the people who spend the most time with you, who you've known for the longest time? How have you displayed God's love to them? And how intentional have you been about sharing that love? Is it just that you see them for a few seconds in the morning and say hi to them? Or have you invited them over for coffee or tea in order to get to know them better, to build a better relationship with them? Is there anyone who can take up your mantle when you've gone? Is there anyone who can carry on this Christian message when you're gone? You know, of course, our, our mantle is Christ's mantle, but it's our witness of Jesus Christ that leads others to emulate us as they learn to emulate Jesus. So is there anyone who you have the opportunity to disciple in faith? Is there anyone that you have the opportunity to help them transform and grow into people of great faith? Now, we, you may think you're not qualified to disciple anyone. You think, oh, well, I've I've got too many of my own issues to work on. I, I can't possibly show someone else how to be a disciple. But that, that's okay. That's okay. You can feel inadequate. And that's, that's fine. And if you're waiting for all of those quirks that you have to go away, though, you realize that you're never going to do anything. You're always going to enter from the, from the position of being imperfect and from being uncertain and from not being sure of your own self about it. But that's okay, because you just have to trust in God that he's gonna put the right words in your mouth, that he's gonna lead you to do the right things, take that step of faith. Discipleship, above all, is about passion for God and passion for people. You want to hook up people with God, because you know that the result is going to be good when you do so. And the Bible is a very good tool for helping people connect with God. It, if it's used faithfully and wisely, not manipulatively or maliciously, the Bible can be a great, great tool to bring people into faith. The Bible is full of stories that testify to our human faith journey. In fact, today's reading from about Elijah and Elisha is really, it's a story within a story. It's the journey on which Elijah and Elisha embark. It mirrors the development of the Jewish faith, which mirrors the development of faith in most human beings. Elijah and Elisha, they start off in this place called Gilgal. And Gilgal really means just a circle or a pile of stones. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see a, a, a sky view of, of Gilgal, one of the sites of Gilgal that's designated as Gilgal. And it's, you know, it's one of those things I remember reading a book on, you know, chariots of the gods and ancient, uh, <laughs> ancient uh, astronauts and things like this. It's one of those puzzling sites with all the arrangements of rocks. And, um, and yet there are multiple Gilgals in, in Israel. I mean, there are, there are five places that people say, well, maybe it was here, maybe it was here. I tend to believe that all of them were Gilgals because I think that when you think in terms of anthropology, humans were doing these stone sculptures as a religious practice. These were places of worship where people came together. It was primitive man's attempt to reach out to the infinite, to something that was beyond this world. Um, if you go to the next slide, one of the things that I loved to see when I was in Korea were these stone pyramids, basically. People would stack stones on the other. This goes back to an ancient shamanist religion, but again, it's people who are striving to reach beyond, to reach this God. And this is, the, this is where our faith journey starts, is this impulse to reach out to God. 
And because we reach out blindly, it helps to have someone who's been there and done that, someone like you, someone like you who has remained steadfast in a particular faith, someone who is being transformed by God in a good way, someone who has fully embraced the essence of Jesus' teachings while also being able to reject or question the, the dogma and the doctrine that come with a religion, so that a person who is anxious to learn about God, somebody who is reaching out, building that stone structure and saying, I believe there's something out there, somewhere for them to get a handle on religion, get a handle on our faith, get a handle on Jesus Christ, and understand that this is, a, we, we, have a, we are in an ancient religion. We have a lot going back. We have traditions and stories that can help a person who is just beginning this faith journey really give structure to their faith, really give an understanding of faith. We have that and we can offer that support to others. So we, we are called again to, to, to be the Elijahs, to show that. Well, from Gilgal, you can go to the next one. From Gilgal, Elijah and his annoying companion go to Bethel. And by the way, I, I say annoying companion because of that. He constantly keeps saying, Elijah keeps telling Elijah, you know, I know you said to stay here, but I'm not staying here. I'm going with you. You know, he keeps on repeating that over and over again. But that's something that another thing that we need to look at in ourselves as we take this opportunity to disciple anybody. There are going to be those people who get on our nerves, that get under our skin, that are going to make us feel uncomfortable. I mean, Elisha calls Elijah, father, father. Um, some people don't like that kind of admiration and that kind of following. And I'm like this, but, you know, be gracious. Understand God is using you. And to one other person, you may be that person's closest earthly connection to the divine, to God. And so be on your, be on your best behavior around those people. Be your most patient. Help those people as they make their movement into faith. Anyway, Elijah and Elisha, they move on to Bethel. And Bethel, Bethel is an interesting place. Bethel is the place where Jacob, alias Israel, wrestles with an angel of God, or, depending on your interpretation, wrestles with God himself. How often do you wrestle with God? How many times has your faith been severely tested? How many times have you felt disgusted with the very institution that we call the church? Or how often have you heard the teachings of Jesus ringing in your ears and just said, no way, I can't do that. I can't live that way. How many times have you wanted to say, oh God, you and me, let's just have it out right now. That's what we go through in our Bethel. We, we've been there, we have wrestled God. New people to the faith, new people coming up, they might have that same urge. They will have that same urge to wrestle with God. And did you know someone when you were wrestling with God? Did you know anybody who was able to help you through your faith crisis? Someone you could talk to, someone you could bounce ideas off of, somebody you could just say, I don't believe in God anymore. Somebody who would be there for you to help nurture you through that. And Elijah, somebody who is going to lead you in the faith. Whether we can help in something so personal as one's faith, well, goes without saying, yes, we can. Faith is very personal, but it's also very communal. And we need people to help us when we're, when we're in need of help. That too is part of preparing someone to take up the mantle after us. Well, from Bethel, Elijah, leads his rather uncooperative companion to Jericho, a city of great importance to Israel's history. It's the place where the walls came a-tumbling down. But remember how that 
whole story played out. Joshua was all prepared for battle, strategizing his attack, and he has this vision, this, this visitation from an unknown warrior. And Joshua asks this unknown warrior, says, are you on our side or are you on theirs? And the stranger replies, neither. I'm on God's side. As a matter of fact, I kind of speak for God. And Joshua, who has just betrayed this truth that he has been thinking that God is standing behind Israel, right or wrong, now he's come to realize, no, God doesn't take sides. God is on his own side. And God is going to do what God needs to do. God does what is right. And Joshua humbles himself at this point, falls down to his knees, on his knees, and he worships. Then he leads his men in a particularly embarrassing attack in the sense that he's instructed to walk around the city so many times and do nothing, which must have really puzzled his men, saying, is this an attack? Is this a new strategy? But the point of that is to show that it is not going to be by the soldiers' guns or the soldiers' swords or the soldiers' shields that this victory was going to come. This victory was going to come through God and God alone. Joshua had to learn that he had to submit to God's authority and do even when, when ridiculous things were required, had to nonetheless submit to that authority and trust in God, follow God and not the other way around. And it's a final step in the rite of passage of Christian faith that helps us when we realize we have to submit to God. We have to submit to God. We have to do as God holds us to do. We lead disciples. We lead them into the church community, into a place that is really an incubator of love, a place where there is grace, a place where there is growth, a place where there is action, where we do what is right. And we lead them to make this profession of faith um, despite their wrestlings with God, despite their difficulty in submitting to God, they led into that profession of faith. And that's where Elijah leads Elisha to this Jordan River, the final destination, where the chariots of fire take Elijah into the whirlwind. And Elisha is left with this double dose of the spirit that inhabited his beloved teacher. But we Christians, we are a hopeful breed. We are a hopeful breed. We can look at the struggles and the conflicts and the chaos that goes on around us, and we still keep this vision of the kingdom in our minds. We still perceive the promised land, and we still trust in God's promise. And I believe that whatever challenges we face in the church, as a church, present or future, that somehow God's spirit guides us and will guide us in the right direction. And we have the opportunity, we have the opportunity to build a church for the future, a church that will succeed us, a church that will take up the mantle and carry it forward. May God open our eyes to the opportunities around us. And may we commit ourselves to the next generation, praying for them, mentoring them, consoling them, helping them with their wrestling matches with God, rebuking them when it's necessary. But may we understand the importance of this mission that Christ has given us, God's kingdom, is coming. God's kingdom is here within us. Let us help it to become a reality in so many people out there who don't know the church, who don't know God, who don't know faith. And I'm not being exclusive here. I, I, I believe that we can help people in, in their own faith traditions, whatever their faith traditions may be. We can help them along those journeys on those paths. Because we all believe in the same God, we all share the same love, 
We all have the same hope. We can do that. But let us not, let us not assume that our job is done. Let us know that we have a generation to raise. We have the Elijah. Elisha's coming up behind us. We have a mantle that we need to pass on. Let us pray. But God, thank you. We thank you that you're not done with us. We thank you that we all have a calling. And Lord, I pray right now that your spirit would just quicken our hearts to recognize that calling and to see the ways that we can serve you in the here and now, in the relationships that we have, particularly with those who are close to us, those who need to know you. Give us wisdom as you gave it to Elijah, when to speak, when not to speak, how to be patient, even when you're pupil is disregarding your requests. Help us, O Lord, to be gracious and loving, and in all ways to show your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ.
peace of Christ, which transcends all understanding, fill your hearts of joy, guard Christ Jesus. Um, please enjoy the post food this time.